Hello, magical people of the internet. I am Jen and welcome to I Never Thought I Would, where we talk about doing things we never thought we would do and the unexpected places that they can lead us. As always, I have a fabulous guest today. She is a romance and a mystery writer, Stephanie Levine. Hi, Stephanie. Hey, Jen. How are you? I'm fabulous. How are you? I am doing great. So happy to be here with you. That's part of the yes. day. I know I'm really excited to talk to you today. We have quite a few things in common and this is gonna be a really fun chat. So um, as most creatives, we kind of go against the grain and live outside of a box and do things that most people would never do. <laughs> right? So I'm sure you have a, a few stories about doing things you never thought you would and I would love to hear one of them today. Okay, yeah, so on that note, I. I think everything, like my entire life has been a series of, I never thought I would ever, because I think I tend, just like you said, like most creatives to say yes to a lot of unreasonable things that in my head seem completely reasonable. And that has led to just nonstop adventures. I had a lot of random sort of physical or life adventures for many years. And then like, um, you know, I've sailed across to you. Atlantic on a sailboat. I've slept in castles and um, hopped freight trains and all kinds of wild and fun things. But that ended up leading into sort of an adventurous life career or series of careers, I guess, at this point. Um, so I ended up working in the film industry, which was when I graduated from college. Um, I built a career in the film industry and then I left it and became a romance writer first and foremost, which was just nowhere on my radar of something I ever planned to do. Okay, I I'm gonna stop you there. So tell us a little bit about your film career before we jump to your writing career. So what, what were you doing in the film business? Um, I landed in New York, kind of sight unseen, literally <laughs> we, ended up my best friend and her boyfriend, who was my friend at the time in a loft right off in, in a Bushwick when it was not what apparently it is today and just had to find my way in. I knew I wanted to work in film and I knew no one didn't have enough money to ride the subway. And I ended up getting a job in the, well, an internship in the equipment room at Silver Cup Studios. I finagled my way into that because that's where Sopranos and Sex in the City shot at the time. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I probably like those shows. I didn't even have a TV at the time for years. <laughs> and so, and my film schooling taught me nothing, you know, about my theater and my film. I knew nothing about the industry. Uh, I wanted to be an actress or write, maybe eventually direct. Instead, I ended up in the equipment room at Silver Cup during their TV commercial season, the TV shows were out and I slowly worked my way up. I convinced somebody to hire me as a PA originally on a commercial. And the second I finally did that, it just steamrolled. I never stopped working for years. And I was climbing ladders um, in the production side, unfortunately. And I say that unfortunately, because it wasn't, it kind of goes back to what eventually happened, why I left but I pursued this other avenue, the production. I'm great with computers and research and art department and all those things. And I just climbed and climbed in this amazing world with just wonderful circles of people who hired me and I loved, um, but I worked mostly on television commercials and advertisement, print, and sometimes, sometimes on films. Uh, I was always told to, or I was, I made a promise to a grip or something early on that I would not do TV shows because they paid so terribly and the hours were so awful in New York. Um, so I've barely done, I have not done a lot of TV shows from production. Yeah, actually but, yep. from the acting side, like commercials are the biggest bang for your buck. You make more money on a national commercial that you probably shoot in a day because it runs so frequently. A TV episode is only gonna run once until it gets into syndication you know, or maybe it'll rerun a few years down the road um, yeah. if the series is still on. Whereas like the commercials have the most play. So you make the most money off of them, even though it's like a one day shoot. That's and interesting. I never thought of it from the acting side. 
Well, yeah. So that, so not just on the acting side, but it just makes more sense that you make more money on a commercial because of the airtime that one commercial would get. A commercial can run for six months. A commercial can run for two, three years. It just kind of depends on the campaign. Okay. Let's get back to you. So you were working mostly in commercials, advertising, print, and you were working, I don't mean administrative, like in terms of secretary, but for people who don't understand the production world, the production world is more admin work than creative work in terms of like, you're not creating the story, you're not writing, you're not performing, you're um, executing tasks in order to assist the creative people getting their vision made. Yeah, so like I started out as a production assistant and that's sort of the Basics. everyone, you know, the base. And then I became a production coordinator, then I produ- a production manager, a production supervisor, depending on what you're in. Then eventually I was producing, which was cool. Um, and I also did art department. And so I was art department coordinator. And, but I, I've always tried to explain it as, and like you're essential, the production team is essential. They're sort of the hub. And for a long time, my job was if there was a commercial and they needed an elephant in a three ring circus and which we did one time. Um, so we're gonna shoot a three ring circus with elephants in the middle of a park in Brooklyn. I have to find an elephant and get it to a set on a certain day and figure out what does an elephant eat? And how do I get two tons of sand and a ring and make sure that arrives and gets there and gets back out. And so like, if you need an elephant at a park that has never been there, like the production team is the, are the people who make that happen. And so it was wild and fun and always different and it stretches you. So it's administrative in an upside down world. Wow, an elephant, oh. Oh the sand is weirdly the hardest part of that. You know, where do you quarry? You're yeah, calling quarries. You find an elephant, no yeah. problem. Just call up the Bronx Zoo. Yes, <laughs> borrow him for a while. Yeah, but yeah. Oh my God. So, so it sounds like you were doing amazing work. You were super successful. What was the catalyst for leaving that job or that industry? Um, it, well, it was, I think twofold one, the core of it was that I was not doing the work I should have been doing, which was the creative work, the acting work, the, the thing that I should have been brave enough to do at the time and to pursue. And I did in little moments of courage. I did, I took a write a class for writing for SNL. And then she promptly, promptly told me that no women write for SNL back at the time. And I, that was pretty discouraging. And I took voiceover classes. I did things, but I was working all the time, all the time, all the time in this thing that I was both good at and worked with great people. And, you know, you're just, you just hit the ground running and it's really hard to stop. And it's really hard to stop and prioritize a thing that's super scary. And the scary thing is often the thing that you love the most and you you feel like you have the most risk of if you fail, it's going to hit you hard, right? So it became easy. It becomes easy to stay in the thing that you're doing. Yeah. Um, So there was that. I can totally relate to that. Um, I'm an actor and I'm also a producer and I get more producing work than acting work because especially when you get to a certain level, it's harder to find competent producers. Yeah. And it is to find actors and hundred percent. And the, when you're just a creative, there's so much instability in your life. And a lot of times people can't ride out the instability and people fall off very quickly. You know, when I was living in New York, I had so many friends who like graduated from theater at NYU. They graduated from the acting program and they were super talented and they racked up exorbitant student loan fees and then within five to ten years a lot of them just kind of packed up moved home and did something else because this it's so hard to sustain and you can't be working full-time in production and do a play off broadway that you're getting paid peanuts for yep and i can't tell you how many times because i was on the production and i was 
you know, I'd be in a casting call and, or in castings and watching and I would, then I'd be in the meetings afterward and I'd see someone incredibly talented, so many incredibly talented people and they'd get, everyone would say hands down, like this woman is the best, right? She just blew it out of the water. And at the very last minute, they would give it to the blonder thinner girl or something, you know, and I just, I had seen that happen a lot. And that's nothing against the incredibly talented blonder thinner girl at the time like that, you know, or the person that they were used to seeing the guy that looked had been in 20,000 other in commercials, they tend to hire the same people, but they'd have a, a fear reaction at the last minute and they wouldn't necessarily hire the best person. And I'd always think, oh, as a, as the creative, as a talent, you're going home, not thinking you were the best or just, or doubting yourself when you were amazing and you're not getting the feedback that you're amazing because of some weird little decision by one random person from the agency that popped in that day. Yeah. And that's a lot hard. of times it's the agency making those decisions. It's not even the director. Yeah. You know, the director's pushing for a specific person. I worked at a casting studio when I first came to LA and I would see a lot of that happening and you know, the casting director, the director, the creative people on the, on the team would be like, oh no, this, this person's the best one for it. And then the executives from the ad agency or the brand will come in and be like, that's not how we want our brand represented. That's not the person we want. You don't notice it, but in the commercial world, a lot of the same actors, like if you, when you work in it, you'll see a commercial and you know them all because they're always working, but there's a, a thing that we do where we find a comfort and familiarity in faces, even though we can't distinguish them. And so you're seeing, you're like, oh, I, that dishwasher soap brand or that mascara or whatever, something about that is resonating with me. It's like, well, that is because that actor has sold you 50 things over the last couple of years and they provide you comfort. So there's, yeah, a lot of consistency in a weird way where they, the agency will just be like, oh, let's go to that. They don't even sometimes realize it as much. They don't realize that they're doing the exact same thing. Well, what about him? They're like, yeah, because he's in everything. Yeah. <laughs> so you felt disheartened by this business, even though you were super successful, you were like, my creativity is dying. So what did yes. you do? <laughs> yes, that was, um, it, was a, it was a true eureka moment. And I was driving out to a job in Long Island um, to shoot, doing, making a ton of money with a crew that I loved for a commercial that was really fun. And I remember thinking, I am a cog in this system. I love part of this, but I need to be on the creative end again. I need to do creative work. Whatever that means, you know, I'm, I'm open to anything, but I knew I couldn't do this forever. My job was great. The people I worked with loved me. I loved them but you're replaceable. You give everything. You give 18 hours of day of your day every day. And if you're not there, someone else comes in and you're not giving, you know, what you could to the world. If, if that's not, that was not what I needed to be doing. That's not what I deep down wanted to be doing. Mm -hmm. And I was doing the thing, like I said, that I was good at because it was easy to do something, to become good at something that I had no fear about or based around. Mm -hmm. And so I, Immediately, I think I ended up going down to the Caribbean. I had some family to live on a sailboat and just hanging out in the Bahamas and like riding in the regatta and just diving and like, free diving like every day. And, and then I went back to Florida for the holidays and just really did a ton of soul searching. And I just knew, I said, I love the people and I love the film industry, but I'm not supposed to be there anymore. And I have to do work. It's not where I'm meant to be, maybe it'll eventually come full circle, but I need to be on the creative end again. And especially I knew after I weighed all the options that I wanted to be a writer because I'd always known that, but I didn't know what that meant. It still would be a long time before I actually became a writer, but that was a real Eureka first moment. And then the month, like the couple months that followed, everything changed.
So let's fast forward to present day. After all that soul searching, fast forward a few years. Now you are a successful writer. You are a mystery and romance writer. And let's talk about your latest book that is a mystery, sweet romance, headlines, deadlines, and lies. This one sort of came about as a personal challenge for myself. It was a bit of a crossover between my romance, my sweet romance that I have, that I write under one of my pen names and becoming coming into mystery. And so it was written specifically for a Hallmark audience. And I was trying to find a way to create a mystery world that could become a Hallmark mystery TV series. And they're pretty specific. You know, you want something that's fun and um, has a, a focal point. And so I chose genealogy, which was pretty seamless because my mom has always really been into that and I've been too busy to pay attention, but it, I've heard a lot of great stories. And so, yeah, so this book was based around that about a single mom and who stumbles into this world by, while trying to create a new life for herself trying to, she works at a magazine, a sort of um, newspaper magazine, and she does a job that she's good at, but not passionate about there. And there's an opportunity to become a writer, at, but she has to write a story and she kind of fibs and says that she's a genealogy expert, um, which she is not at all. And so then the mystery unravels because she decides to, she has a best friend who, never knew her father. And she's like, oh, I'll just find out about her long lost father. And that turns out to be a lot more complicated, the story and the mystery of finding out about the father than anyone expects. And and there, therein lies the mystery. Oh, sounds so intriguing. And then what about the romance aspect? So you said she's a single mom. So does she stumble upon a, some sort of romance along the way? <laughs> He's a little dreamy, but um, no, I always say uh, it's it's really it's a story about friendship and family, but then and the um, things we do for our family and these sort of lies and secrets that we keep to protect uh, the people we love or ourselves and the romance lead. Uh, he is a crime reporter who comes back to this town to take care of his grumpy old dad and so he's this big worldly guy and but he's just a, this amazing sounding board and also a foodie and just really fun and um, they they end up just having their own you know she kind of comes into her own like she enjoys the fact that he, she doesn't think he knows she has kids which sounds terrible but for her having someone treat her like herself is really important yes and i think that's something i never expected because i had not planned my whole my life much about around having kids and when I did I it's a struggle it's not like a major struggle but it's a weird transition you don't realize will happen where people start treating you in a different way and you're like whoa whoa just like you said I'm still me and I still have dreams and I'm weird and funny and very specifically me and you know I and you want to be treated as such and when you meet new people you know, you just have that cast over you sometimes. I haven't had to deal with it too, too much, but I see it a lot. I mean, I have it on my own personal struggle, you know, just yeah. identifying yourself. And so you also have the Fox Hill mystery series that I wanted to mention too. And can you just tell us, I, I know you've got three books in the series already out. The fourth one is about to come out. Can you just like give us a little kind of couple sentences? Yeah, for sure. Um, that's the, the Fox Hill uh, Southern mystery series. It takes place in Tennessee. Most of my books are really, really Florida. I, I call them palm tree mysteries, like everything that's going to be coming out aside of that. But um, this one takes takes place in Tennessee and a little rinky dink town and a big time, the girl who moved away moves home and she does, she inherits a music hall from her grandparents who retire, this dusty old music hall that she grew up around. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't want it. She wants to go back to Chicago. But of course, her old best friend and her old best friend's brother are there. And there's a mystery afoot having to do with corruption and a corporation that's buying up the town. And then that sort of she ends up staying and trying to save the town through all of her marketing and PR prowess and just the thing that 
things that she's the person she's grown into, she can now bring back to her town. And they're really fun and yeah, kind of rowdy. Yeah, sounds like so sweet. much fun. Oh, I love it. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that you took the time to chat with me today. And I can't wait to dive in to your series. It sounds really intriguing. And also the headlines, deadlines, and lies sounds fascinating. <laughs> so, so. so I'm so excited about all of these books. And can you tell us where we can find you? Where can we find the books? Amazon, everything's on Amazon, BookBub, um, Goodreads, and uh, my website and Instagram. I'm trying to be better. What's uh, your website? Tell us the website. StephanieLevine.com. And then the Stephanie Levine on most of my other handles, but StephanieLevine.com and Stephanie Levine on Amazon or book bubble good reads or any of those places. Excellent. Thank you so much. And of course, we'll have all the links below to make it easy for everybody to find Stephanie and her fabulous books and series. And I just want to thank you again so much for chatting. It's been so much fun. Always. Thank you so much for having me. I am so glad to be here and spend time with you. Awesome. And thank you all in the interweb for tuning in. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I want to challenge all of you out there to do something you never thought you would do. Let us know what it is and where it leads you in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Have a beautiful day.